Uh, hello, uh, welcome everyone to this meeting of the Community Preservation Act Committee on November 16th, 2023. I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. We're meeting remotely via Zoom, Zoom as permitted by the town and the state. This meeting is being recorded and will appear on the town Amherst CPA webpage uh, at a later date. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna call on committee members so that we can make sure that everyone can hear and be heard. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm Sam McLeod, uh, Bob. Yep, here. David Williams. Uh, we're not able to hear you. It might be your uh, mute button is on. Yes. There we I'm go, here. Tim. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear us, Tim? Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry. My Doug dog Marshall. barking. <laughs> Present. Michelle? Present. Robin? Present. Present. I see that Matt has arrived. Uh, yeah, here? yes. We can hear you too. Wonderful. So uh, we do have uh, a need for a minute taker at every meeting. Uh, Tim has kindly volunteered to take the minutes for this meeting. So we have a busy agenda in terms of presentations and there's a number of folks in the audience. Uh, we do have our first item of business on the agenda, which is to approve any outstanding minutes. Uh, we have minutes from the September 14th meeting in our packet. Um, I saw one edit to them on the second page where a word appeared twice, so I will edit that. Uh, I believe the word was the entire. It appeared twice relating to the roof. Um, do any members have any comments or um, edits related to the minutes? I see a hand from Tim. Uh, minor point uh, under the Zion Church, under my motion, I have an E at the end of Neil that was left out. Small okay. point. But okay, that can be uh, taken care of certainly. Very good. Uh, any other comments or edits relating to the minutes? Uh, it was there were only a few of us at that meeting. Uh, four of the attendees are here. Uh, <clears throat> So um, did anyone, everyone get a chance to look at them who was at the meeting? I move to approve the minutes from 9-14-2023 with suggested edits from Tim and Sam. And I will second. So we have a motion and a second related to the minutes of 9-14. Are, is there any discussion? I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to proceed to a, a roll call vote uh, on the minutes. Uh, Bob. Aye. David Williams. Aye. Tim. Aye. Doug. I will abstain as I was not present. Michelle. Aye. Robin. Uh, abstain. Uh, Matt. Aye. And I will vote aye as well. So if my calculations are correct, we have six votes in favor, two abstains, and one absent. Uh, so the motion passes. Uh, <clears throat> the next item on our agenda is public comment. We have a number of folks in the audience. We did receive letters from uh, 28 individuals, uh, re, uh, which interestingly enough, everyone was in favor of this, the pickleball project. Uh, we're not talking about that yet, but if uh, some of the audience members have written letters and wish to make a comment, I uh, recognize that we have received those letters that were submitted to uh, Holly uh, Summit to myself as well. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the <clears throat> open up the floor to attendees for public comment. This is something we do at every meeting. It doesn't have to be generic to any specific 
issue on this agenda. Um, and please uh, raise your hand if you wish to make a comment. If you're not able to, uh, please uh, seek to communicate via chat or other method. Uh, you can also telephone in. Uh, the numbers are on the website, the phone number. I don't have it on me right here. I see a couple hands that are raised. The first hand in the audience uh, was Ryan Harb. Holly, if you can uh, bring uh, Ryan to where he can, he or she yep, can. I already have. Yep. So Ryan, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, so my name is Ryan Harb. I'm a resident of Amherst. I live at Three Willow Lane, part of the Misty Meadows Property Association located in South Amherst. And I was hoping to have a minute tonight to speak about actually the uh, one of the proposals that's on the agenda, which is the proposed pickleball courts at Kiwanis Park. So our community got some letters um, about, about this and has uh, taken some steps to just meet and talk about it because there were some concerns that were brought to us about citing residential, citing pickleball courts in residential neighborhoods and some of the negative impacts that are happening in other communities around the country. And so this led us to actually kind of take an investigation approach and to visit other pickleball courts and other towns uh, to interview residents who are actually living in close proximity to other pickleball courts and to just ask their honest opinions on whether or not there's any negative impacts to their, to their living environment. Mm -hmm. And what we found out that there was um, there's been a lot of concerns that have been raised, and there's actually a lot of articles that are written about it. So th this is kind of a short, you know, comment about it. There's a letter that our um, Missy Meadows Property Association has submitted to uh, Paul Bockelman already, and maybe that's found its way to some of the committee members. Uh, if not, I'd be happy to share it. But uh, right now, we've taken a vote as a neighborhood association and voted unanimous unanimously to oppose the pickleball courts. And we did not take that lightly. It's not something that we're anti-pickleball by any means, because I hear that there's 28 letters supporting pickleball in the town of Amherst. And so I would say I would be somebody who would support pickleball courts in Amherst. I'm somebody who wants to actually start playing, but it's the proper location of the pickleball courts that our community has concerns about. And there's four major issues that we'll you know talk about maybe in more detail as comments become available. But it's basically noise and sound is one Parking, traffic, and activity is another uh, alteration of existing uses of the field. And then the fourth one being the negative impact to nearby home prices. And so we have kind of ex expressed these four concerns in a letter. Uh, we'll share that you know, with, with you all, but respectfully, we're just asking for having some you know, due diligence on this a little bit more to not rush this process because we, we feel like there's some really significant concerns that our community has. And so again, we're, we're not anti-pickleball by any means. We actually want to have this be a constructive conversation with the town. So I'll, I'll stop there. I don't want to take up all the time tonight, but just kind of wanted to introduce myself and just kind of br bring the issue forward and see if we can have a conversation about it together. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, you, I do recommend that you pr submit your letter. You can email it to Holly or to, uh, I believe it's Amherst CPAC. Uh, uh, well, look on the website for the correct email. Uh, you can also email it to me, uh, smcloudns at aol.com. I'll make sure that Holly gets it as well. Uh, we can also reach out to Paul. Uh, thank you. We Today is just presentations. We have deliberations that will occur at a later point in time, as well as a public meeting. Uh, the next person who has their hand up in the audience is someone named Pat. Uh, so, uh, Holly, if you're able to uh, bring Pat in. Good evening. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. My name is Pat Ananibako, and I live on Tamarack Drive. And I'm here to oppose the pickleball that has been proposed in my neighborhood. I'm not opposed to the to the game itself, but I don't believe it should be in residential area. I do have a family member that has autism and you know I worry about noise and the disruption on, on him. And so I'm here echoing what Ryan just said and you guys will be receiving 
um, a letter from our association. Uh, I'm one of the board members for Misty Meadow, but I will stop because I know you guys have a lot of uh, items on the agenda tonight, but thank you for serving on CPA board. Uh, thank you, Pat, for your comment and we'll look forward to receiving your letter uh, if you have difficulty um, <clears throat> getting it to the appropriate email, you can also email it to me and Holly. Uh, thank you, Pat. Sorry, could I interrupt? I'm taking the minutes. What's her? What's Pat's last name? Can you spell it? Oh, is she gone? I believe I can get it for you because I I'm familiar Great. with. I'll, I'll get that later. No problem. Um, Damn, Michelle has her hand up. Please. I see that. I want to open it up for the audience attendees first before committee members uh, to give them the opportunity. Um, there are a number of attendees at this session. If any of the attendees wish to make a public comment, can you please raise your hand so that we can see you? Um, I'm not seeing any, seeing any additional hands raised. I'll so wait a minute. There is Pat with a hand raised. I'm not sure if it's the same Pat or not, because there's is two. the same Pat. But there's two uh, in the... My understanding is the same one, but uh, if it's not, Pat, uh, feel free to call her in. I, the, hat is, the hand has been lowered, I see. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, second call for public comments from the attendees. Please raise your hand. Uh, we'd like to give you the opportunity if you wish. You also can reach us via letters. I see that Carolyn Mailer has her hand up, Holly. Yep. Uh, Carolyn, the floor is yours. You currently have your mic on mute. Okay, I'm on two. Sorry. Hold on. We I'm on two different uh, computers here, so I have to get one down. We can hear you. I'm um, here to represent the pickleball community. Um, I've been working closely with the town we have for the past several months. And I know the pickleball discussion hasn't officially started yet, but I just want to respond to Brian and Pat and let you know that we have considered a butters at every one of our meetings and done some research and have several ideas for mitigating the noise. Um, and some of the other problems. So at some point, we'd like to discuss those. I don't know when the right time to do that would be. Uh, okay. Um, any further comment, Carolyn? Uh, that That's it. Just uh, if I can get some advice about when to speak up <laughs> or not. Um. Well, the public comment, we're here to listen to you in terms of the project managers. I believe it was submitted by uh, the Recreation Department and Amy uh, Rusiecki. Uh, the proposals indicate uh, who the applicants are, and it seems to me that that might be a good starting point. I am going to call on Dave Zomack right now, given that there's a question relating to process and who to communicate with and uh, I know Dave is familiar with it. I see that your hand is up, Michelle, but forgive me. I'm going to call on Dave because of the inquiry. Go ahead, Dave. Sure. Thanks, Sam. Um, I I just want to acknowledge uh, Ryan Ryan and other folks' uh, uh, comments and concerns on on this call. I know that I spoke to the town manager. Um, I'm losing track of days here. Yesterday, I believe, when Ryan was in the office. And uh, we are committed to sitting down with Ryan and the Neighborhood Association as soon as we possibly can. Um, so I hope that we can still hear the proposal from uh, Amy Rusecki and Ray Harp from the Recreation Department and DPW, respectively. And um, we are committed to, to meeting with the Neighborhood Association. Again, we're, we're, we're going to try to get that on the books as soon as we can around the Thanksgiving holiday. But we are we are on top of that. I just wanted to put that out there. To, Thank to you, Dave. Uh, I'd like to ask the audience attendees again if anyone 
uh, wishes to uh, make any further comments or additional comments, please raise your hand. Carolyn, uh, we did hear you and hopefully Ryan and Pat uh, heard uh, Dave Zomack's comments. So he'll uh, and the time will be reaching out. Um, I don't see any other hands. Uh, so I'm going to end the, I do see a hand, excuse me. Uh, Anna Carter, you seem to have raised your hand. If that's the case, please, uh, can you bring her in, Holly, and let her communicate? We want to give the public the opportunity to communicate if they wish. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, so I attended the neighborhood meeting, and I've lived in the neighborhood since 1996. And I, I think... Um, very uh, increased traffic, increased noise are some of the main points that I think we're all concerned with. And um, many of the other concerns, I, unfortunately, I just entered the meeting now because I had been out until now. Um, so I don't know what's already been expressed, but um, I think that a, one of the arguments or, or points that was pointed out with some of my my neighbors was that the athletic fields are are excellent for the youth in Amherst, and um, the fact that increased traffic, increased parking, increased noise would be um, added by three pickleball courts. And um, I agree with the point of view that pickleball courts, if possible, should not be located near residential areas because of some of the research that's been done that makes um, pretty compelling arguments that it increases the noise in the community and, and even decreases the property value. So those are all concerns that were expressed that I agree with. So I just wanted to register that. Uh, thank you, Anna. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you coming to the meeting and communicating your thoughts to us. And I look forward to meeting with the committee in person, like um, David Zomack said. So I'm looking forward and I will do everything I can to attend that as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, is there any other, I see uh, another hand from Carolyn Mailer. Uh, Carolyn, is there anything you'd like to add from your previous comment? I'd like to say that the, um, CPA grant, receiving the money does not necessarily mean it's going to be put at the Zomek, I'm sorry, the Kiwanis Park as proposed. Um, there are other options. So I wouldn't want the, uh, the controversy here to prevent us from getting the money we need to do courts wherever they are. Um, yeah, I think it's important to move forward happy to meet with the abutters, but if we don't get the second part of this grant, we won't be able to do courts at all. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. Um, if anyone else in the audience wishes to make a public comment, it can be regarding anything. It doesn't need to be related to the uh, recent comments of others. Uh, you have an opportunity. I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, again, I'll say a second call. Uh, I see a hand. Uh, Joyce Hatch. I'm sorry for our presenters. We're going to try and keep you on time, but we definitely wish to allow the public to make their comments as they wish. Uh, Joyce, if you have a comment to make, uh, your hand was up, but I don't see it raised currently. Um, if you have a comment to make, please go ahead. There. There, I'm on, I was unmuted, I was muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, I'm, I'm a big supporter of pickleball courts in town. I think they're very much needed. And I think many letters were written by people of mostly older uh, people who are now playing, but I just wanted to express that I see young people starting in the public courts, like in South Hadley and a couple of other areas, where they're public and they're free. So it's, I originally was very enthusiastic three years ago about 
courts because for seniors um, because there aren't facilities and if you no longer can play tennis, it's great. But then I've seen this increase in youth playing too. So I just want to be on record of supporting pickleball courts. Um, I understand the, the neighbor's concerns and I hope we can find a place that meets um, everyone's concerns. Uh, thank you, Joyce. I see a hand up from Carlos uh, Turiago. Uh, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, Carlos. Uh, yeah, you did. Thank you. Oh, hello, everybody. Hello. Um, this, uh, I'm a resident of this town for almost 30 plus year. And this is the first time that I have an opportunity to participate in a forum like this. This is really like a great lesson to me in terms of my community. Uh, I am a resident in uh, South Amherst. Um, I'm part of the Association of Tomorac. And, uh, excuse me, I, I live on Willow Lane. And I've been here for almost 20 plus years. Uh, when we have a, a conversation as a town, there will always be the sense that a group of people want something, another group of people don't want that, and somebody else have a different idea. And that's the beauty of having an open space where we can talk as a members of this community. I think that my neighborhood, we value whatever decision is taking in terms of helping the community to do things, physical activity, sports, or whatever. But what surprises me about this issue of the pickleball is the process. Decision have been made and we were not invited to talk, to be informed about this, the community at large. And it surprises me because I'm hearing voices that I haven't heard before, faces that I haven't seen before, and you guys are making decisions, are about to make decisions about my neighborhood. I would like to know you in person. But I also want you to know that in a democracy, if you don't engage me, then I have to react. And that's what we're doing right now. We're creating a space to say something because we were not invited to the table. And I think that that's not the way to go in terms of having a conversation that is a friendly conversation, a mindful conversation about the whole community, because we belong to this town. It's not that we wanna go against something that some people might benefit. Everybody benefits from the decision, but less people to participate in the decision if the neighborhood is involved. That's my minimal requirement. I don't think that I'm asking for too much. This is the second time that a decision has been made in our neighborhood and we have to have a voice because we were not consulted. And this is the second time and we'll do it a third time. I will do it a fourth time because if we are not consulting and engaging in the initial conversation, we are gonna get our voice. But I wanna sound friendly about this because I do want to engage in a respectful conversation where we listen to each other. It's not about convincing us or convincing you. It's what is good for the community as a whole. But in order to get that, we need to share. We need to share opinions. We need to share the conversation and don't allow those with power to make the decision. And then when the decision is made, we get a letter. I'm surprised about that. This is the second time around that the town has done something that we had to react. But I invite you guys and us to have a conversation, a beautiful conversation about the town, about what is the best solution about this. If there is money involved, yeah, let's let's keep the money, but let's find avenues that allow us to make the best decision. With everybody's view is taken into consideration. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Carlos. Uh, and uh, thank you for taking the time to participate in uh, town. Uh, opportunities for the first time. I would, would like to communicate that the committee, our committee, uh, first received notification of this particular application, as with all other proposals and applications that we've received on October 13th. So uh, this is our standard process where we uh, invite the public to share their opinions on individual comments. 
uh, related to any particular project. So uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. And uh, uh, I would say that your comments were received uh, as intended in a friendly manner uh, with concern. Thank you. Um, are there any other members, attendees who wish to make any comments? I see Rachel Harb. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, listening to all of our comments today. Um, I, uh, my husband Ryan shared his thoughts earlier, and I want to chime in with mine. And um, I, I, I want to say that I do strongly oppose the pickleball courts being located at Kiwanis Park. Um, and you know, I am thinking about the voices that we heard at our neighborhood meeting. Um, so many concerns were raised. Um, and just echoing all the comments about not not locating these courts directly in residential areas who are greatly impacted um, and hopeful that there can be another location that um, will not be disruptive to neighbors. Um, I'm, I, I'm sure that my husband did not want to um, share this because he wanted to protect my privacy, but, um, but I did want to contribute to the conversation and just for consideration that I believe that the the noise factor is a greater concern that I, I initially believed having looked into it now. Um, you know, our house is located just one of the closest ones to the proposed site. Um, I'm someone who suffers from chronic migraines. Um, I get them, you know, multiple times a week. I'm constantly managing pain. Um, and I don't know if any of you have experienced migraines, but it can heighten sensation, um, you know, noise, light, all that. And so I have greatly appreciated my quiet neighborhood that allows me to get plenty of rest, um, you know, quiet when I need it to recover from migraines. And uh, I, I have a lot of concern um, thinking about not being able to um, fully rest and recover due to the noise. And I do echo many of the other comments that um, my fellow neighbors here have shared. So th that's what I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for joining us and for sharing your thoughts and comments on uh, this issue. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands raised in the attendees. Um, I'll wait a minute certainly wish to allow everyone to communicate if they wish. Sam, I think it would be a good time as well to just notify everybody in the audience that the public hearing on all the CPA proposals will be held on Thursday, December 7th is what we're scheduled for um, as well, which would be another opportunity for folks to speak on any CPA proposal. Uh, thank you, Holly. Uh, I'll reiterate that we'll have a public hearing uh, it will be posted on the town site and uh, there's an opportunity for individuals to speak on all the projects. I believe it's, as Holly said, uh, December 7th, uh, Thursday, which would be in an evening. Um, I don't see any further hands, so I'm going to go ahead and end the public comment time period because I think everyone's had an opportunity. Uh, Michelle, you've raised your hand on a couple of occasions very patiently. Uh, is there something you'd like to add? I was just <clears throat> trying to figure out where Misty Meadows was and I found it via Willow Lane. So maybe Amy, when she presents, can just touch upon like the actual proximity of the neighborhoods to the pickleball courts. That's all. Thank you, Michelle. So uh, for all the uh, presenters, uh, that would be you, Amy, for the first four. Uh, we're running a little bit late, but uh, we want to make sure to give you uh, the time that you need scheduled. So we'll just push everything back 15 minutes. Um, so uh, I see that Amy is in the audience and uh, we're ready to hear from you regarding starting with the Qantas pickleball courts. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad that we're starting with pickleball courts because there's been so much discussion about it. Um, so I'm Amy Rizeki. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Public Works for folks who don't know me. Um, and I'm actually going to share my screen because I have a couple of slides. Um, and uh, so bear with me for a sec. Um, 
And as I'm doing this, I'll also recognize that we have um, Dave Zomack and um, Ray Harp here as well. And they're both, um, you know, Ray with Amherst Rec is, um, you know, he's been a, a partner on this as well. Um, and then Dave has been helping out with the process as well. So um, they may also jump in with answers, I guess, is my point on that. Um, so I just want to kind of run quickly through the proposal for the um, the pickleball courts at Qantas. Um, so just a little history, because this has been talked about for a while, and this was actually one of the questions that came up um, from our initial proposal. So I just kind of want to talk about the timeline here. So um, for the FY23 CPA, um, a group from the community submitted a proposal for three pickleball courts. Um, that proposal initially envisioned it at the Mill River Recreational Area, um, and it was for $120,000. Uh, that was ultimately approved uh, by CPA. Um, once the town was you know, given the money to say, hey, here's some money, make these pickleball courts happen, um, that's when the town started to really um, sink our teeth into it. So we were meeting um, town staff, the Amherst Rec uh, Commission, and the Friends of the Pickleball Group have all been partners in this conversation. And we were just trying to figure out where exactly they would go and how we would locate them. Um, and, you know, to kind of summarize, uh, you know, a good year's worth of conversation down into a statement, um, ultimately, um, we thought that the Kiwanis Park was the best location we could have in town to build these three pickleball courts. Um, and certainly I recognize that um, there, you know, there, there are some, there are some opinions on that and that not everyone agrees with that opinion. And so it sounds like, um, you know, more conversation needs to be had on location. Um, but earlier this year, town staff did start working through the permitting process, but also as we worked through permitting and we looked at the funding, um, that we were given $120,000 was just not going to cover the full um, breadth of the project. Um, and that's regardless of location. That's um, just in general, the cost for the fencing has you know doubled from the original proposal. The cost for painting um, has nearly doubled from the original proposal. So that 120 was just, even if we were at Mill River, it still was not gonna get us three pickleball courts there. Um, I'm going to actually skip over this because I feel like a lot of the letters talked about um, the importance of pickleball or why people are so um, excited about this, um, having pickleball courts in town in general. Um, and then I'll just talk about um, this kind of runs down um, the line items. Um, and you'll notice actually the site prep and paving and the permitting, those two items weren't in the proposal that you guys got because that's what the initial um, FY23 CPA allocation covers at this point. And so what we're asking for is the additional 100 for the surface prep and paint, the pickleball nets, and the site fencing. Um, and to the left of the screen here is, um, this is just a, a quick schematic of where the pickleball courts, um, the siting of where we were thinking about them on um, at Qantas Park. Um, Michelle, I wish I had a more blown out version so that you could actually see where that is in relation to, um, you know, houses or other people in the neighborhood, but it is kind of tucked behind. Um, that's actually the front, the front here. This is actually a um, wastewater pump station. Um, so that's actually a municipal building that's right in front of um, where we were looking to site them. So uh, anyway, that's, that's my, you know, quick overview on Pickle, the pickleball proposal. Um, Ray or Dave, I don't know if you guys have anything to add. I think the only thing, if, if that's all right, Sam, the only thing I would add is that, um, you know, this is very early in the process to some of the concerns that were raised earlier, very valid concerns. And, and um, um, any of these town projects have to go through a rigorous permitting pathway. And so um, the Conservation Con Commission has considered this uh, proposal and, and found it um, meets um, and, and has 
received a, what's called an order of condition, another word, order of conditions. In other words, you know, impacts to nearby natural resource areas would be quite limited from this proposal. However, um, there's still a great deal of process left to go through. This has not got, this would need to go through the planning board uh, site plan review process, which is very rigorous. Any siting of pickleball courts or recreational facilities would need to go through that. So I just want to assure the CPAC and, and the neighborhood uh, folks, residents, uh, that there is, uh, that process has not really started yet other than the Con Conservation Commission. And if it were to move forward, um, there would be significant um, opportunities for feedback in addition to the meetings that Paul Bockelman has uh, talked to Ryan and uh, uh, some of the association members uh, about. Um, I just wanted to echo, I think, what Carolyn Mailer said and what um, Joyce Hatch said is, I think we, regardless of whether Kiwanis is selected as the site or not, I think the important thing is we we can all, I hope, recognize the support for pickleball and the importance of creating some court, courts somewhere in town. So I hope the proposal can move forward. And uh, if this is decided not to be the right site, um, we still fund the the project and create pickleball courts um, in a site selected in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. I see your hand, Tim, but uh, I want to, if uh, Ray, I, I don't know if you have anything to add as well. Good to see you here. Welcome. Uh, if you'd like to speak, please do so. Thank you. No, I, I can just uh, say hello to everybody. I think that uh, Dave and Amy both certainly sum up where we are on that. Uh, thank you, Ray. Um, anything else you'd like to add before we open the floor for committee member questions or comments? Amy? No, um, I'm, I'm happy to open it up to questions. Okay. Sure. Uh, Tim, I see your hand is raised. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, I don't think we need to have the answer today, but I have two questions. One, uh, I have the assumption that the approval of the funding would be for the courts in any location. Like the funding is not unique to uh, Kiwanis Field. So that I think is going to be important as we make our final decision. And the second is uh, one of the other proposals is to upgrade the softball fields at that same park. And there's use for many other activities. So I am just curious as to the volume of vehicles, people, noise, et cetera, for all the other uses of Kiwanis Park. To me, it just doesn't seem that adding three pickle courts is going to add that much more uh, noise and car activity and parking uh, than what already exists for the use of that field. And if the softball fields are increased uh, or improved, we might see more activity, et cetera, et cetera. So I just need to have some better understanding. Again, we don't need that today, but maybe the applicant could uh, address that in, in their future uh, presentations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, Michelle. Um, hi, I was, so you mentioned that the fencing costs like increased it substantially. And I was just wondering the purpose of the fence is really to keep the ball around. Right. And in pickleball, you can't really hit the ball very far. And I was just wondering if you, you definitely need a fence with a pickleball court. And if like, can you shave off $55,000 if you have to, to get pickleball courts in there or is, or is the fence necessary or could it be a backstop or something like that? Yeah, I mean, you, my understanding, I, I actually have not ever played pickleball. So this is my understanding from talking to other folks. Um, but my understanding, you know, the fencing that we were looking at, um, you know, we were just looking at a four foot tall fence. So just tall enough that it would kind of contain the ball. And then there's also a, an even shorter fence that goes in between the different playing courts so that you don't have any cross play and kind of the safety factor of that. So, um, so we're not looking at some of those super tall um, fences that would add cost. I can add that in uh, comparable courts in the area, they different towns have done it in those two different ways. Some have added the separating fencing in between courts to, to allow the 
one game to stay where that one game is being played and not have the overlaps. And some have decided to just have open courts looking like a basketball court where there's uh, in line to in line, there are three courts, four courts there. And and the community on and and those two can be a little bit affected by how you separate those, but the uh the fencing around the, the court is necessary to answer your question. Thank you, Ray and Amy. Now, uh, Bob. Yeah, um, uh, two questions. One, um, what is the, uh, the, that map came up so quickly, I wasn't able to get oriented, but how, what is the distance of that location from the neighborhood is one question. Number two is, is the treatment plant does it provide any, you know, sonic relief? And I guess the third question would be, um, I assume that there have been other locations that have been considered and ruled out as substandard. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to start with the last one. Um, and I'm hoping as I'm doing that, that maybe Dave or Ray can look at um, distances to the neighborhood. Um, but I will talk a little bit about some of the sites that we looked at. So the town kind of took a very broad scope of where we might want to look. So we looked at Groff Park. Um, the biggest limiter with Groff Park was just where we'd have to put it because we have a lot of the playing fields that are right next to um, the roadway and the uh, parking lot area. And so it would have to kind of be tucked in the corner, which isn't a huge deal, but in order to make it um, handicap accessible to get there. You've got a really long um, sidewalk to get there. And so that substantially added to the cost. Um, we did look at mill. Obviously, that was the original proposal. Um, one of the big detractors there was um, they were looking at taking part of a parking area there. Um, so taking away parking spots, it was going to take away, I think, somewhere between 16 to 18 parking spots, depending on how you oriented it. Um, and so then you're adding another use, which is going to add a couple more cars and you're taking away 18 parking sp spots, which, you know, when there's a couple of little league games going on in the back corner, you're already kind of maxed out. You know, we've got a pool, we've got tennis courts, we've got two softball fields and we've got a pavilion and recreation area. That parking lot can get very busy. And so then taking parking spots away and adding another use, especially when there's no parking on the side of Route 63. So there can be no overflow parking there. Um, that was one of the big limiters at that location. Um, and then we looked at the cow, um, the cow pasture as well, or um, which for folks that don't know, that's right across the road from the North Amherst Library, right across Sunderland Road there. Um, and that one, um, it, it could technically go there. It um, you, you were kind of squished in a little area that, you know, wasn't going to be accessible by, um, it didn't have parking there already. So we'd have to either look at parking or connect it to other parking. And so then that adds a sidewalk to get there, um, which is going to add cost. Um, and you, you're limited to a really small space because of nearby um, floodplains and that sort of thing. So the point is we did kind of really cast a broad net and just kind of kept um, different things very much added cost or added um, uh, additional complications, which is, you know, how we landed at Qantas. Um, Dave, do you want to talk about the distance at all? Do you have that number? Uh, or I, I guess it, it's really up to Sam as to how, you know, how in depth you want to go here. Happy to really quickly answer those or at least touch on those questions. Um, I can go. I can go really fast. Um, so, to Tim's question about upgrading softball fields, I mean, again, we can go into more detail later. But anytime you upgrade or improve a recreation facility, um, if you build it, more people are likely to come. So, if we improve the softball field in the far corner of Kiwanis Park, um, we are we are going to see more use of that. It's been kind of a um, uh, uh, a lesser used recreation area um, because the facilities are in need of upgrading. So I think I just wanted to address Tim's question. Yes, if the, if we improve the softball field through one of the other proposals, it will get more use. When the Fort River school fields are, are taken out of uh, commission for that 
new project uh, down the street, um, recreation areas are going to have to absorb some of the, uh, the use. Um, in terms of distances, I don't want to go into great detail, but um, we can do all of that on our GIS. Um, you know, nearest house is is over 200 feet away. I'm I'm gonna uh, I don't have it right in front of me here at home, but I'm gonna say ab approximately 225 feet, and then and then uh, houses range, you know, between 200 and 600 or more feet away, and it depends on where you where that where folks live in the neighborhood. Um, let's see, what was the other? Um, and and the other thing, uh, somebody asked about, can we? Can we put up barriers? Can can the treatment plant there, the sewer uh, pumping station? I think that's a level of detail that we're just not ready to go into tonight. We'd be happy to come back to you on that. But the the bottom line is the balls, the the wiffle ball wiffle ball like balls for pickleball hitting the 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 paddles that is uh, identified as the noise that is most challenging to mitigate, I guess, is the way to, to put it. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, Doug Marshall, Doug, your hand is up for a bit there. Well, I, um, I, was, I am on the town GIS and from the approximate location where Amy was showing the courts, it looks like the nearest house is probably immediately to the west on Stanley Street. And that's about 220 feet, as David said. And the nearest house across the street in the Willow Street area uh, looks like it's about 330 feet or so. And that uh, development heads north away from this site. So I don't. I think all the rest of the houses are farther away. Uh, thank you, Doug. Uh... I have a couple of questions. I'm familiar with that field, having coached a lot of soccer games there. I assume Matt is as well uh, in years past. Um, I know the location. Has, is that the location where it needs to go in that Stanley Kiwanis Park field? Or is there the capacity to put it further back on the right corner? In other words, uh, directly further in, uh, perpendicular from Stanley Street? Or if sure. not, is that something the uh, town planners might look into? We have looked a little bit at that. That is a possibility, Sam. The, sim the quick answer is, short answer is yes. That is a possibility. Um, and here- now, What uh, you, I, I will point out though, like if you've played soccer there, if you move it from the location that it is, then we're not able to still put a soccer field, you know, like it cuts into either where we put the soccer field or where the, the, you know, baseball or softball oh. is on that field. So it, it, it just compromises the play playing space of another um, yep. sport. And that might be an okay compromise, but it, it would um, compromise a different playing exactly. field in the process. Yeah, it, it sounds like it's something to at least look into. I haven't been may there I, in some time. May I, to Amy's point, sure. one of the reasons yeah. why it was settled in the space where it where it was settled is because that field is not already is not already scheduled for field use. Uh, that's where the talk about the trees that were there, uh, the trees that were being removed there. It doesn't interfere with the with the with the any of the action that we have on that field right now. And so to move it into place where there is scheduled or potentially scheduled uh, uh, action and especially coming up with the with the use of that field changing with other projects in town, that that becomes doubly the the most optimal space in that in that area without giving up uh, parts of some of the project, either the existing activity or the proposal for the pickleball courts. Uh, thank you, Ray. A follow-up uh, question, I guess, would be or request would be hearing what I'm hearing from attendees. Uh, I'm wondering if it might be worth looking into sound barrier fences, not necessarily surrounding the entire courts, but perhaps, I mean, it's a dual, you lose the vision, but you might deflect or prevent some of the uh, wiffle ball type noise if you have, you know, they have them on highways, not ideal of course, but maybe uh, something on the north side, just a thought. Um, 
And I had one last question, which is, it seems like there's a lot of interest. I'm curious how the pickleball court access gets scheduled. Uh, is that something that is done through the town to prevent uh, conflicts that may occur in the future if there's a, a lot of interest? Uh, is that like similar pool lane swimming? I'm, I don't know if you've gotten that far on it, Ray, or not. But We've, we've started to look at all of that. Uh, I can tell you that that's part of the the conversations I've had with other sites in the area. Um, the encouragement that we we went into this with the intention of looking at open play almost exclusively, much like we have at Mill River with the basketball courts, where it's set for open play. People show up, they play, you can organize it. Uh, the pickleball community has ways of of uh, they they do already have a language in Argo of of pickleball that allows you to reserve time. So we as you show up and have uh, basically drop in drop in activity. Uh, uh, but uh, we would like with the basketball courts at Mill River, we would reserve the rights to have a community event there or something like that if that came up. But by and large, it's an open it's an open play uh, it's an open play proposal. Uh, thank you, Ray. Uh, do any other committee members have questions at this time? We also can email questions at a later point in time or suggestions. Uh, Tim, I see that your hand is raised. Yeah, I, I don't want why well, I'm going to repeat myself. Uh, for me, I'm not sure this committee should just make this decision based on the location. I think we should leave it to the town professionals for that. What we need to do is make a decision of a expenditure of funds. So a key question for me is, uh, would the funding be the same regardless of the location? Um, so if the, if the applicants could get back to us on that, that would be helpful, at least for this one committee member, okay? Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Uh, anything you'd like to add, Amy, on this application proposal? I think the only thing, this, this conversation has been great. And I think the other thing, somebody raised the question about the pump station. Um, and I do notice that kind of where we've looked at the site, it's somewhat tucked behind that pump station and that pump station does have a row of really tall ibervites. Um, I don't know that I've looked at it specifically to see, um, you know, how good of a shield that might be. Um, cause I haven't, you know, really looked at those specifics, but I I'm curious about that. And that might be something to, um, you know, for us to look deeper at. So I appreciate the comments on, um, a lot of the questions here. Uh, thank you, Amy. And thank you for the, uh, responses from all, all of you. Um, so I guess that's good enough for now. Um, and further inquiries or questions can be provided to the committee and or to the applicants. Uh, the next project on our agenda, uh, we're running over, but that's fine because it's you, Amy, for all of them for, for now, you and Ray. Uh, the Mill River Tennis Court Rehabilitation. All right. I am going to share my screen again. Um, yes, I am sharing a screen and here we go. Um, all right, so this project is for, um, to give some uh, rehabilitation attention to the Mill River Tennis Courts. Um, and again, you know, recognizing Dave and Ray um, at, as, you know, we all work together on this one. Um, so this one, um, short and sweet, um, as you can see with this photo and a couple of the other photos that we'll show, um, there, there are some cracks in the Mill River tennis courts. Um, and a lot of it is actually stemming from uh, the net posts and how we how the net posts are currently installed. Um, and so what we want to do is remove the existing net post and install them using a different uh, technique that will not cause these cracks. And then we want to fix all of the cracks and then um, repaint, um, refinish the surface. Yes. Uh, so just kind of bringing these tennis courts back up to um, a, a more safe and playable surface. Um, so the need for this, um, again, um, it, it really stems from the nets and the, the damage that they're causing. 
um, but the cracks are affecting the playability and safety of the surface. Um, this photo, I tried to show with my pen just how wide that crack is. I could fit my entire finger in it. Um, so it is a pretty wide crack. Um, and there's cracks like that throughout the play surface, unfortunately. Um, and you know, we'll point out that um, at least on town-owned land, these are the only um, town-owned tennis courts that we have within Amherst. So it's certainly a valuable resource. They're used a lot in the summer especially, um, and um, the, the project cost, it's, you know, doing the net post, repairing the cracks, and then um, painting the play surface, and hopefully removing all of this grass that's growing in the cracks along the playing field. So, um, Ray and Dave, I don't know if you guys have anything to add to this one. If you have anything, just speak up. I can't see you. So if you have something to say, Ray or Dave, at this point, just do so. It looks good, Amy. Well, then we'll take questions. <laughs> Trying okay. to catch you back up. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Um, any committee members uh, like to make a comment or ask a question? Well, I would. Um, so it, I, it's interesting looking at those photos, the, uh, the amount of tension and damage that the, the net tension can do on those um, supports. Uh, those are certainly some uh, serious cracks throughout. I'm curious how, how, how effective are repairs to cracks like that? That is to say, have we done this in the past? Um, and separate from that, are either any any of you aware of the process that's used to actually repair those cracks? Thank you. Yeah, I I'm not. I don't know exactly how they do it, but I do know that um, you know, in as we were preparing this, we consulted with uh, a company that does do those repairs and the um, surface repainting. Um, and so, you know, it is, it is a, you know, professional company that does this for basketball courts and um, tennis courts and, you know, various outdoor playing facilities like that. So. I, I ask because those seem to be uh, uh, cracks on steroids squared. <laughs> and, Some of them uh, are pretty big. Yeah. I, I'm curious. It'll be interesting to see how that progresses. Another question on this project is when would you anticipate this project to commence, assuming uh, funding is granted? Yeah. So this, um, you know, the, the, the toughest thing with this is that um, you have to get the right temperature. Anytime you're doing paint or, you know, kind of repairs to surfaces like that, you have certain windows with temperature and with moisture um, when you can work. And so, um, you know, once we got the approval, you know, obviously we would get in touch with the company that does that immediately, but it might take several months to get on their calendar. And if we miss the window in the fall, then we'd be looking at trying to get on it early in the spring. Is it um, the same company that would be doing the paint resurfacing as doing the crack repair? Yeah. Okay. And uh, last question, the, uh, am I correct in my understanding that it's the entire plane surface that's going to get recoded uh, with some form of durable, flexible uh, paint or epoxy, I guess. Uh, it, you're redoing the entire surface after, or right. they're redoing it after the cracks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from committee members on this project. Uh, okay, anything you'd like to add, uh, Amy, Ray? Well, just like that, we're back on schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Bing, bang, boom, okay. Uh, thank you. The next item on our agenda is the rehabilitation of softball facilities. Uh, we're, we're listening. Okay, going back to the screen. Um, I kind of love, before we switch from this, I love 
I kind of love and hate this photo right here because it shows over time how much those tennis posts are bowing um, inward. And it's just from years and years of people trying to tension the nets and eventually it caused enough pressure. Um, so it's pretty powerful when you look at that. Um, anyway, um, softball field rehabilitation. Um, so again, in partnership with uh, Ray and Dave on this project. Um, and so this we're looking at more holistically, we've got outside of the Fort River facilities, we've got three other softball facilities within Amherst. And we're looking at um, rehabilitating them, um, all three of them, giving them some attention to uh, bring the uh, playability of them back up. Um, and so we've got one at Community Field, which is the one that the, um, the high school girls varsity team plays on. Um, we also have one at Groff Park, and then we have one at Gowanus Park. Um, and so this photo here is actually the one at Groff Park, um, just, just for your reference. Um, and we're looking at regrading and rehabilitating the infield. So kind of leveling off the whole infield, making sure that there's not, you know, holes or high spots in that, um, replacing the field hardware. So that's, um, new bases, um, at some of these locations. Uh, repairing the backstops. It's really, I think, only at Groff Park that the backstop is in backstop is in rough shape. Um, and then replacing bleachers at these locations as well. Um, the photo here, this is of Kwanis, where you can see that the entire um, baseline. So the the Groff Park and Kwanis both have um grass on the infield and it's only kind of this infield mix on the baseline um you'll see that the um community field the varsity field has infield mix on the whole infield um but um yeah anyway you can see crab grass here that's grown along the baseline over time um so these as we were saying these are used um the softball fields are used by the community they're used by the um, Amherst Regional Schools. Um, Amherst Recreation does um, programming and has adult league softball on them. And then Amherst Baseball does have a softball program. Um, and I'm also told that they're, um, uh, sometimes the t-ball also plays on the softball field. So there's a lot of different various uses um, throughout the town for the softball fields. Um, and especially we're trying to think ahead with the Fort River fields, which are, you know, some of our most premium uh, softball fields in town. Uh, with those going offline for construction, we just have to kind of think ahead of where we can put some of these displaced um, players. And um, so this is kind of thinking of how can we bring some of these other facilities up in the quality so that they can absorb the usage um, during the time that Fort River is offline. And again, um, some of the conditions of the fields, it's affecting the safety um, and playability of the fields. Um, you know, imagine you hit a ball and it rolls all the way across the infield, but it hits a lip at the end and it goes into the the air. Um, I suppose that gives Amherst a home field advantage, but I don't I don't know that everyone else appreciates that. Um, and again, especially when it comes to community fields, and this is an Amherst um, public school site, and so Title IX compliance certainly comes into the conversation on that. Um, the photo here, this is of the community field. So you can see the entire infield um, being that infield mix. Um, and you can also see the you know standing puddles. So we've got a low spot between um, home plate and first base. Um, and then there's uh, kind of a couple of frost heaves on the third base to home plate um, line there as well that you can see is collecting water. Um, so ultimately the uh, budget that we're looking at um, you know, as proposed. So uh, the regrading and the rehabilitation of those infield areas, um, that's the biggest cost of the project, um, but then also the hardware, the backstops and uh, the bleachers. So that's that's what comprises the whole project. So that's kind of the brief overview. Um, these photos here, um, the one to the left, that's the uh, fence that's at Groff at Park. So that's the backstop at Groff, Groff Park. Um, and then the one to the right, okay. that's one of the bases at, um, at Kiwanis. So you can not only see the base, but there's actually a nice hole right afterwards that um, 
I'm, I'm glad that nobody's gotten injured on that, but certainly um, that even with the crabgrass there, uh, you know, having a hole like that right after the base, I can imagine is a, is a safety issue. So um, I'll, I'll open up to, I don't know if Ray or Dave have anything to add on this one either. I would just reiterate that um, uh, from my perspective and the recreation director's position is, uh, Amy did mention it, the big, the driving force here is thinking ahead for Fort River and managing fields when, when Fort River comes offline. Uh, thank you, Amy. Thank you, uh, Ray. Um, uh, Bob, I see that your hand is raised. Um, yeah. Um, for, is this the Community Preservation Act or the Community Reconstruction Act? Um, it, it, it Looking at those tennis courts and those softball fields, which I've been looking at for the last 20 years, it just seems like there's a lot of work to be done. I, I'm curious, as we start to get into all this recreational stuff, we get to War Memorial and move down the line here. Is there a way that we wrap all this together into a bonding issue instead of, because we're going to start to talk about some very big dollars. And I'm just curious how CPAC interfaces with some of these larger projects. And I know we're just at the beginning of the line with softball, but if you kind of look at it all as a whole, we're, you know, talking millions here. I don't know, Dave, if you want to jump in on that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think we could certainly take that under advisement and, and talk to Paul Bachman a little bit about it, Bob. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's both interesting to think about, but also hard to get your head around these things because they're, they're so different in many ways, like building building a new bathhouse at at War Memorial is very much different than rehabbing rehabbing three softball fields. And so the disciplines and the, the general contractors needed and you know you don't need architects to skim three fields or even build three pickleball courts, but you need an architect to design, build and oversee a, a, a new bathhouse that, and make sure it's all up to code at uh, War Memorial Pool. So there's certainly some economies of scale, I think is what you're talking about for sure. Um, and there's no question, um, you know, and Amy and Ray and Paul and others, we talk about this constantly that um, unfortunately we haven't given enough attention to these facilities over the years. And I think we started probably eight to 10 years ago, started to, to really look at these, these facilities all across town, recreation facilities I'm talking about. And we, we did some upgrades to War Memorial Pool and got some matching grants to, to help us with that. We did the same thing at Mill River. So we did War Memorial, Mill River. We did some baseball fields, but um, we have not um, put enough capital money and CPA money and grant money into these recreational facilities over the years and it shows. So we're trying to catch up. It's really a game of catch up is to, to upgrade these fields to last us the next 20, 30 years. And then also at the same time, have the resources to maintain them over time, to paint them and mow the, the, uh, the, the outfields and make sure we don't get lips and in fields that are dangerous and, and, and things of that sort. So it's both upgrading them and also maintaining them over time. So we, we can certainly look at that, whether it makes any sense to bundle some of these even with the bidding process. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Doug? Thanks. Yeah, I was gonna make a comment about that and uh, then I had one question for Amy. Uh, it's my impression that the work on the fields that doesn't include a building or architectural work can be bid under chapter 30 and that work on something like a bathhouse would be under chapter 149. And typically in my experience at the university, it's more cost effective to bid things under chapter 30 when you can bid them under chapter 30. 
So uh, bundling may make sense for some of the, the sort of site work horizontal construction that you're talking about with the fields, but including a bathhouse would probably be more expensive and probably more cumbersome and uh, to have to do everything under chapter 149. So that's my perspective without a lot of uh, expertise on chapter 30. Uh, the, co the question I had, Amy, uh, we are faced with a couple of million dollars worth of requests and uh, one point something uh, available funds to uh, give away. And uh, so my question would be, uh, of the 85,000 that you had broken down, uh, you know, how, how easy would it be to, to work with 60,000 or 40,000? You know, are you going to just, uh, would you do, still do something at all three locations? Or would you just say, okay, we're just going to, we're going to rehab one field and pick one or two fields and pick two? Um, so, um, it's a great question, Doug. And, um, I, I will state my opinion, but certainly that's the sort of question that I'd love to, you know, have the opportunity to have, you know, Ray and Dave and, you know, Alan Snow, um, from our, from the DPW weigh in on as well, because we may have, have different opinions. And I'd love the town to have a consensus, um, of a response on that. Um, but personally, I think if the if the budget on this were um, shortened, we pro I I would prefer to see at least one field brought up to that level rather than three fields brought to, you know, only brought up so much. Um, and so, and I think you know the the commu the community field, the varsity field, that's probably the most important one that gets the most usage. So that would be my highest priority to, to bring up. Um, that being said, I would I would still have concerns with um, you know with Fort River going offline if we don't have at least one other site to be able to absorb that usage because otherwise yes you could bring community field up but then if you put all of the usage on the one good diamond um, then you're just gonna you know fall into that same pattern again to, by putting too much use on it so um, okay, but then. that you know again I I'd love to hear Ray's opinion on that. Or our rec commission had a, a, a pretty strong and and uh, divided conversation about this proposal in particular, uh, because the issue of, frankly, the issue about whether or not those other two fields, Kiwanis and Graf, uh, rise to a level of importance for as community does. Uh, on one hand, it, it, two different prongs of this. On one hand, we've been pretty assertive about saying we want to try and build our core and build community field and build that that space in the center of town and put our investment there. Uh, uh, and then we also are looking at a at a management plan for those other source those other fields. Um, our our interest is I I think I agree with. Uh, Amy there and saying that our first and primary interest is the community field. Um, but again, and, and bearing the weight of expectations in the next few years, that's why I'm not willing to, to throw away those other two fields and the impact that they're going to have in programming for us. But community field is, is I think, uh, I think I'm speaking uh, in general for the conversation we had in the rec commission last week but i think i think that our interest is in building that community field but also understanding that that we're going to have some some uh, uh some burden being spread in the next few years thank you um him yeah that that actually was going to be my question um regarding the opinion of the town regarding the uh, priorities, because if we have to make decisions, and we will have to make decisions, assuming these project costs remain the same, of not being able to fund everything, uh, where would we best place the money? And that 
kind of gets to the other project that we're going to access later, trail restoration and so on. Uh, I, I, for one, as a committee member, would not like to make a value judgment based on what I think the town priorities. I would think the expert should, and I would love to have some kind of an opinion if dollars are scarce, where you folks would would uh, prefer to uh, spend the dollars. So, Michelle, I'm I'm just gonna give it a testament to how bad those other fields are. And I've been injured and I've seen people break noses on those lips. And I played at Kiwanis when it was probably better than it is now. And it was so terrible. And like kids are playing there. And like that's like where generations are coming up and they have the space to play when they're getting outcompeted by the varsity field and the people that get preference there. So I just wanted to say that that those fields are used by everybody and they're pretty dangerous. And, um, you know, when the grass grows in, your cleats get stuck and you can't slide and like all kinds of things happen. And I just wanted to sort of throw that out there because I understand throw, you know, making one field nice, but all the other people that have to play on those other fields are kind of getting exposed to all the dangers that you've mentioned in your presentation. So I just, I just wanted to give my personal testament there. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Dave Zomak. Your hand is up. Um, yeah, just a couple of thoughts. One is, you know, I just want to remind everybody, you know, that through the CPA, but also through our our capital dollars and state dollars, we are going to create what amounts to, you know, one of the best fields in the future will be at the Fort River School. That is that was a central part of the recreational facilities there is the community advocated very strongly for a a wonderful, if you will, state of the art softball field there. So uh, I think that is coming, but it'll be a couple of years before we get it. So, but CPA dollars went into those or is going into those fields. I would agree with Amy and Ray that our highest priority should be the field central to the high school, middle school and community field. So if dollars are tight and we know they will be, um, first and foremost, um, I think the town would like to see that field brought up to the highest standard possible, and then we may have to prioritize from there, and that would be up to, you know, Ray as the pro uh, programming department for, you know, our fields, and then Amy, uh, the, the Department of Public Works that takes care of them to decide if, if we don't have money for three fields and we do two, which two are they? I would say that we start with, with a community field, that varsity field. Um, because it also um, serves uh, young women in our schools and and Title IX is very important uh, and we we support that. Um, so we start there and then we would choose another field. Um, and I think as you you know, as you know, we will be going through all of these proposals and in some, as Tim has indicated, and frankly, with some of the housing uh, uh, projects that have been proposed, there's always some flexibility in what the numbers ultimately are. So uh, that'll be uh, something, I know we worked really hard last year uh, to bring that number into uh, uh, a range that was fundable. So I think at the, end of the, at the end of these presentations, that's really when the hard work will begin is how do we figure out uh, how to fund as many of these worthy projects as possible. But we're, as staff, we're willing to work with the committee, of course, as always to do that. Thank you, Dave. Um, Doug? Yeah, I just wanted to sort of uh, ask a question that we can talk about when we get into deliberation or at least after Amy's fourth project of presentation. But um, uh, Dave, you sort of touched on the fact that we're behind on maintaining existing uh, facilities. And so one way we could think about this is do we want to build new facilities that are going to eventually need maintenance too, or do we want to be devoting money to maintaining the existing facilities we have? And uh, Amy, I'll just say, maybe you guys have a perspective on that. I don't know whether you want to voice it at the moment, but uh, at some point we may want to hear that. Doug, it's like, it's like you're a plant. Um, 
I've been saying this for years that I love new facilities, but we got to maintain what we're doing. And I feel like as much as, you know, the town loves to build some of these new parks facilities and that sort of thing. But unfortunately, that's partly how we've fallen behind is by not putting money towards rehabilitating what we have. Um, so um, that that's something I've been a long advocate for, and I'm, I'm glad to see so somebody else share my <laughs> opinion on that. Well, I, I also know it's a lot easier to raise money for a new exciting thing. Right. You know, it's clear the pickleball community is very excited about you know, generate, you know, having a facility, well, maybe there's some enthusiasm in that community that could be leveraged. Uh, and then the town can devote its resources to maintaining what it has. So I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to throw the wet, uh, you know, throw the pickleball community under the rug, but, you know, most of your proposals seem to be for maintenance uh, rather than creating new things. And I, I just think we've, you know, the town is trying to do a lot of things right now and we're gonna have to be careful. So I'll stop. Thank you, Doug. Um, I have a question or comment related to just the general fields and in particular um, community field. Uh, you know, the field is certainly uh, used by the school uh, and in response to the questions it was indicated 90 percent during the school year with greater usage by rec um, you know the conditions aren't new it's certainly a challenge because amherst uh, no matter what field you go and community might be one of the better ones there's a lot of water uh, there's a lot of damage to grass a lot of use and a lot of use outside of any athletic school events but has the town uh, school facilities attempted to repair any of the issues and in the past? Uh, and might some of these uh, maintenance type aspects as opposed to new, new creations be uh, something that might be appropriate for a school budget? It's a thought. Uh, given the use. I don't know if Dave wants to speak on that. I'm gonna I'm gonna remain silent on that. Um well it's an interesting yeah the whole conversation is interesting. Amy and many of us have had this conversation about you know kind of what what you know what should we invest in right um I guess on the softball front, I, I actually would argue that um, these are not new facilities. All three of these diamonds have been here for a long, long time. Oh, yeah. I think decades. So we're not creating any new soft. The, the new softball field we're creating is actually at Fort River School. Well, there's one there, but that is significantly upgraded. This is really rehabilitation. I don't, I use rehabilitation because that is appropriate for CPA. Uh, CPA should really not be used for maintaining. So we are re rehabbing all of these fields and and making them much much better than they they are today. In terms of the school, Sam, um, you know we have a good working relationship with the region. Um, you know the town puts in certain monies on an annual basis for capital. Um, we are always trying to work with them creatively to increase that amount, but it's all coming from the same pot, which is uh, taxpayers and uh, state funding. So um, we we trade off. There are things that they invest in and that we don't have to invest in, um, like, uh, for instance, um, you know, a lot of the heavy lifting, if we do a, a new track, will come from the schools. So CPA dollars will go into that, but the, a lot of the heavy lifting will come from the schools. So it's kind of a uh, collaborative, cooperative relationship, but but it doesn't mean we don't ask. We do ask, and we we try to get help where we can from them. Yeah, I don't I don't envy the challenge of uh, town staff uh, with all the all the demands. Uh, it's a lot to do, and uh, I certainly recognize that from my perspective. A, a follow up question, similar related to uh, you know that it's used by schools. How about town? DPW and grounds staff. Um, have we ever used that staff 
in this type of capacity. Uh, that is to say, does the expertise exist within the town uh, from the existing employees for a project such as regrading of softball fields? We don't have the equipment to be able to do that. Um, it's my understanding when, when like the Zomac diamond, so the baseball diamond at community fields, when that got regraded, um, the, the money was put in to, you know, bring in the equipment and bring in, you know, some of the expertise. And then we supplemented that with the tree and ground staff. And I think Amherst baseball actually had some volunteers there as well. So they also collaborated on that. Um, and so certainly those are some of the measures. I mean, those are some of the measures that we would do to keep the cost down. Um, you know, I think given the scope of fixing three softball fields and you look at the cost, you know, that that's part of it is we're trying to do as much um, in-house and keep the cost down as much as we can. But um, stuff like laser leveling is just not, um, we don't, you know, we don't have the equipment and the expertise in-house to do that. Uh Thank you. Um, do any committee members have additional questions or comments? I have a quick question for Doug. What is chapter 30? What's the key distinction of chapter 30 versus 149? Um, well, you're, you know, I know enough to be dangerous and not enough okay. to be an expert. Um, chapter 30 is used for what they call horizontal construction. So it's, it's roads, it's sidewalks, uh, uh, you know, I think bridges may be included, uh, yes. but when you get into uh, buildings and uh, vertical construction, as they call it, uh, then you have a whole, a greater set of procurement requirements and the bidding requirements are different. Uh, you have filed sub bids for different trades and it gets uh, just a little more complicated. Got it. Uh, thank you. Um, so just, yeah, just as an aside that all these are public properties and they will all have to follow procurement laws and um, that will all go through my department in order to, um, through our procurement officer to make sure that everything is bid out properly. <laughs> add, add that to the list of things to do. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, thank you, Holly and Doug. Uh, any other comments uh, from town uh, applicants, Amy, Ray, Dave? on this project. No, okay, thank you. Uh, next project, uh, is everybody good with me continuing? Do we need a two minute break or? Everybody seems to be nodding to continue. Uh, revitalization of the enhanced war memorial area. Okay, last one. There's one following you as well. Yeah, last one for me, sorry. <laughs> um, and again, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, so this, I, it, those of you guys that were on the CPA committee last year heard us talk about kind of the phase one of this project. Um, so this is something that we've been talking about for a bit, but we're looking at revitalization of what we're calling the Enhanced War Memorial Pool Area. And again, this is a project with, um, with Dave and with Amherst Rec and the DPW all working together. Um, so to kind of give a little bit of a timeline on this, um, in 2019, we had the Amherst Facilities Strategic Plan um, that was um, written by Weston and Sampson. And one of the things that it really recommends is um, reconfiguration and enhancement to the community field and the enhanced war memorial area. You know, it talks a lot about kind of um, focusing on the core, but one of the phases that it particularly calls out is the um, community field and enhanced war memorial area. Um, the schematic here that we're showing is kind of the the ten thousand foot view schematic that they had of the area that has you know the pool and a new uh, bathhouse, playground area, basketball courts, where our tree and grounds building is, um, and to orient you, the high schools in this corner and the track and field is here, and. Um, you know, Zomac Field and all the playing fields are right over here. Um, so last year, you know, given that this was a priority um, and given that the bathhouse, you know, the, the kind of linchpin in this whole thing is that the bathhouse at War Memorial Pool needs to be replaced. 
but we didn't want to simply just replace that building without thinking about what the other uses of this area are and what the needs of that bathhouse are. And so last year, um, we were successful. Um, you guys approved $200,000 for the schematic design of that area. Um, so kind of just looking at what we want in that area um, so that the bathhouse can be designed. Um, and so right now we're in the process of identifying uh, the consultant that will do that schematic design of the area and the design of the bathhouse. Um, and I, I will note that um, part of that process is public input about what features are there. So is there going to be a playground? Is there going to be a splash pad? You know, do we have basketball courts? You know, we're, we're not set on what features are there. And that is part of this process is um, public input to help us define that area. Um, and so what we're doing right now, um, what this project is, is the next phase of that. And so it's to take the design that the, this phase one comes up with and um, move it to the next phase, which would be construction. Um, and so uh, the ask is uh, 750, um, 750,000 for the complete design and the town matching portion of the construction. Um, and what this is gonna do, you know, we do recognize that this is a little bit putting the cart before the horse um, in a way, because what this allocation will do is give us the town appropriated funds to be able to apply for a park grant or uh, an LWCF grant, um, which requires town matching funds. Um, so really what this is gonna, what we're hopeful that this will do is set us up for um, being able to be successful, obtaining some state funding to cover the bulk of this project. Um, some of this we talked about last year, but just the need for it, you know, really the linchpin of this is uh, the War Memorial bathhouse that needs replacement, but this is also a great area to revitalize. Um, you know, a lot of the, the playground equipment is, um, it, you know, it's in rough shape. It hasn't been upgraded in a while. And certainly, especially with, um, you know, the playing fields, both the Zomac Diamond um, and the softball fields right up, you know, right next to this. And then you go across the road and there's the track and field and soccer fields. And so a lot of times, you know, people are looking for a place to say, bring a kid when one of their other kids is maybe running in a track meet, um, but they have a young kid that they need to entertain for a little bit. And so having this space um, be revitalized. Um, it's it's part of why the Weston and Sampson study highlighted that. Um, and like I said, the matching funds we need for the state grant. Um, so what, you know, what we're looking at, you know, ultimately at this preliminary stage, you know, we think this is about probably $2 million for this entire area. And that that's a, you know, very rough back of the calculation or back of the envelope calculation. We don't fully know um, we'll have a better idea as we move through the process with the consultant in phase one. Um, but, you know, I, I put below the, you know, if we apply for a park grant, we need a 30% local match. So if it is a $2 million project, that means we need $600,000 in local match um, at minimum. Um, and then the LWCF, Land, Water and Conservation Fund, that needs a 50% local match. And so again, if we're a $2 million project, then we would need 1 million um, for that. So, you know, we're, some some of this is unknown and we get that we're, like I said, maybe a little bit putting the cart before the horse, but if we wait for all of phase one, because of the timing of when you have to apply for these grants, if we can't allocate through CPA this year or somehow otherwise find the funding from the state or from the local match, we're going to have to wait a whole nother year to be able to apply. Um, so um, yeah, that's, that's the broad overview of this. Um, Dave or Ray, I don't know if you guys have anything you want to add to this conversation. I think I'll wait for questions. Okay. Uh, thank you. Amy, um, <clears throat> I guess I'd like to open this up to questions or comments from the committee. Bob, I see that your hand was up first. Um, sure, this sort of gets to my uh, pre 
previous observation. I, I, I understand that each one of these projects is kind of trench warfare. You need the match and to get the match and you put it together. And the next thing you know, five years down the line, we've got a brand new war memorial project put together. Um, what I just think about the limited resources that we have and 600 to 750 is the ask and all the other things we heard about in the previous meetings and in future meetings. I'm, I'm As we move down the line on the athletic um, strategic plan, are we to expect an ask proportionally large in each one of these projects as we move ahead? Maybe that's a question for you, Dave. You know, when you get to the track and you get to um, sort of bringing Amherst up to state-of-the-art athletic facilities, are we going to be putting increased pressure on on CPAC funds? So happy to jump in on that, Sam, if that's okay. Um, yes. So, yeah, it's a great question, Bob. I think, as I, as I indicated earlier, um, my... My my thinking is that, you know, we really started to get serious probably eight or 10 years ago about the backlog. That was kind of the, 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 the word I was looking for earlier. We have a tremendous backlog of recreation upgrades that we have not done. Um, and I think I and some other people started to raise that concern 10 or more years ago and we began to tick off some of that backlog. You know, uh, you all recall when War Memorial closed. Uh, War Memorial closed because it was unsafe and the um, the lining and filter system was 1950s. And so we spent some CPAC money and we got some grant money and, and uh, here we are. And likewise, Mill River. So I think we're, we're ticking off some of the easy, easier things but this one is a pretty big one. If we want to keep War Memorial open, we need a new bathhouse. And again, from the staff standpoint, why why do a new bathhouse unless you look at the whole area around War Memorial, which again, the, the play structures are from the 1950s. Those are original. I know some people who played on them when they were young, um, myself included. So um, they're still there and they're not great. So I think, yes, there, there, there could be some big ass, but let's put it in perspective. The Weston and Sampson plan, which I hope you all read if you haven't read it, looks at phases. This uh, is really part of kind of phase one. The track and field is uh, the big nut in, in uh, phase one. And then this is kind of part of that phase one. I'm very realistic. I don't think we'll be moving forward on phase two or three or four of the of the Weston and Sampson plan for years. I think it we're 10 years, 15 years or more down the way for some of those other um other changes in field. But one of the the, the underlying message in the Weston and Sampson plan was we should invest in the core fields with the most money we can. And those core fields are community field, the regional high school, and the regional middle school. So that's what we're trying to do as best we can. So I I love the pictures of the other communities, but there's no way I'm moving to Framingham. I want you to know that. Uh, thank you, Bob and Dave. Uh, Matt? Matt? Yeah, uh, I have a couple of comments and then um, I have a question. So just to respond to Bob a little bit, it was my first year on the CPA committee last year and I found a lot of this a little strange, the process, but um, second year around, it seems to make a little bit more sense. But just for your information, last year, um, the CPA put a substantial amount of money to... Uh, support the Fort River fields as part of the um, Fort River the school project. And then the year before, I believe, the CPA committee put a substantial amount of money already into the track and field at the high school project. 
So that one actually the CPA already has put money into. Um, then going to uh, Amy's presentation, a couple of things that came up um, in the recreation committee meeting that I found quite interesting. So just in to speak to the urgency, and this was, again, when we went through this uh, process last year with the 200,000 for the preliminary design, um, there was a, quite a bit of discussion about the, the the detailed falling down state of the uh, bathhouse at War Memorial and um, how it's it's broken basically and it's not really working um, and that that sort of goes to the urgency like if we don't fix it it's likely to close you know this the situations we've had in previous years where it closed for a season or part big part of a season we're at serious risk of that happening if we don't replace the building um, and then the, the other point um, with respect to the preliminary design one of the things that is being considered that I found quite interesting was um, public facing restrooms in the uh, bathhouse. So not only would this be a facility to support the pool, but it could also be a bathhouse facility to support community field and the, the track and field project without mm. people having to go into the interior of the high school to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So that's a couple of points. And then my question, um, and I'm not sure the best person to answer this, but um, for this 750,000, how much of that needs to be uh, sort of as cash and how much of that could be capitalized or does it make sense to capitalize all or part of it? Uh, Dave, are you asking, Amy, Amy, Holly? Are you asking Dave, if they Holly? need cash on the <laughs> Um, are because you it asking... doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like the seven hundred fifty thousand would actually be spent immediately. It would be several years out before that would actually be spent. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Matt. Um, you know, Holly, uh, excuse me, um, Amy outlined. You know, the mo one of the most compelling things about this is you know that without the local match, we will lose at least a year, maybe even two, if we get out of the grant cycle for the park grant and the land and water conservation fund grants. So we really need, we need a cash match for that. Are you asking whether it could be borrowed or, or? Well, yeah, because if it's borrowed, then it, we pay for it. We, we, we commit to it now, but we pay for it when it's needed in two or three years time. It's a Holly can speak to this, but it's a both of those programs are reimbursement grants. So we have to expend the money and then get reimbursed for the state or federal side of the uh, the ledger. So we have to put all the money out and then we get reimbursed in a fairly timely fashion. So uh, Holly, I would defer to you on, you know, could this be borrowed? I believe it could be, but I, I defer to you on that. I believe that it could be borrowed as well. As long as there is an appropriation or a borrowing authorization, you would be able to count that as your match. Um, and again, borrowing is something that we we just really need to be fairly careful with because the more and more we borrow, the less and less we're going to have to give away in subsequent years because we have to make those payments no matter what. So borrowing just really ties our hands in future years as to how much money we'll we'll have to give out. Um, not saying that larger projects and bigger dollar amounts aren't sometimes much easier to manage that way to get, you know, everything that we want to do um, accomplished, but it's just something we'd have to carefully consider. Uh, Doug. Um. Short, quick question for Amy that maybe I missed in the in the in the description. Uh, when I look at the the Weston and Sampson master plan in, illustration for that area, uh, the DPW facility with the trucks and the plows and everything goes away. So, is there any relationship between executing this vision? and uh, the DPW facility that we haven't yet built. 
So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna clarify that just a little bit that um, the building that you're referring to that's just the tree and grounds department of public works. So it's just one portion, but yes, that is basically across the road from the track. Um, and at least the scope of what we're looking at with the project, we're realistic that that site is not going to be moving in the next few years. And so the scope of what we're looking for in that area is assuming that the tree and brown building will remain where it is. And so it that's that's part of why that 10,000 foot view as we zoom in, it's not going to have the, the full scope of what they might have envisioned because we just don't have as much space even okay. to... Play. So they're going to have to be a little more discretionary about what they put in there. So this this two million dollar project doesn't buy all everything I saw there in that on that side of the road. No. The Weston no. the Weston Sampson model that was in that presentation uh, includes images from from intense early on, and there were basketball courts. To answer your question, there there were basketball courts where the trees and grounds building was. That's not part of the. Okay. That, that wasn't presented as the as the summary of what's going there necessarily. Okay. Thank you. Kim. Um, the seven hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars that is dependent on the total cost of the project. So if the cost was less than two million, say one and a half million. Uh, the town could get by with a, I don't know, a $600,000 match or a six fifty match, right? So how how close are we to really understanding what the cost project or what the uh, price of the project is as we try to grapple with this distribution of, of funds with uh, uh, not enough resources to cover all the requests? Uh, you know, I'm a little concerned about approving the entire 750 if we have a really shaky understanding of that $2 million cost. Uh, any way we could get a better understanding of the total cost and thus have the 750 number be a little bit less? I uh, just wanted to ask, well, obviously you probably couldn't ask in that right now, but as we proceed in our deliberations, that I think will become important. Yeah, I think the the number will become clearer the, the more time um but i will also point out that 750 that we put in you know even assuming that 2 million dollar cost which that is an assumption but also you know we don't know if the park grant or the lw um cf grant is going to be the better um option for us or which is going to be a more viable um ask and one of them even under that two two million one of them's you'd be asking for 600 and the other one we would need a one million dollar local match and so that 750 also you know it could the the local match could be higher or lower depending on what which of the grants we think is more likely to be successful so there's a lot of unknowns i guess is my point um I have a question, I guess, partially related to Tim's. Uh, has there been any feedback or has the town heard anything that would be pertinent or helpful to communicate to the committee uh, relating to the feasibility study that's in process and yet to be completed? At this point, we're actually in the process of finding the correct consultant, you know, identifying the consultant to do it. So we don't have that feedback yet. Um, and I I see that there are two grants under that have potential uh, possibilities. I, I'll make a comment that I'm quite impressed with the number of grants that the town has been able to secure for various projects. It's wonderful to have that level of resources and whoever's doing the applications for these, uh, you know, kudos to the forethought and, and the planning because it's obviously tremendously significant. Um, can you apply for both of them? And, you know, is there any, you know, which one's most likely to happen? I mean, we got the part grant. My understanding is when we did the Qantas field, we approved the CPA money with the park grant pending. Uh, Dave, and so did we approve the Kiwanis Field 
before we applied for the park grant or did we just kind of know we were going to get it? So I'm wondering about the timing of the need for the funds um, in order to apply for the grants. So, so the short answer, time. yes, we, we can apply for both of the grants. Land and Water Conservation is federal, but it goes through the state. And then the park, which stands for uh, Parkland Acquisition. Acquisition. I had it on the slide. And restoration for local communities. It's a C. Yes. Yeah, for communities. We and renovation. For renovation. Yeah, yeah we renovation. can get both. Um, I'm not sure which field you were referring to, Sam, but we got the we Kiwanis, used both. the Kiwanis, excuse me, Kendrick Park. I misspoke. Kendrick Park. Kendrick Park. Kendrick I Park misspoke. was just a park grant. It was not land and water conservation. Rolf Park, the spray park and playground was both, if I recall correctly. But they need to be the funds need to be uh, available and confirmed in advance of the application, because uh, I know we had a quick turnaround on the Kendrick Park, uh, the the playground. In so front. that so that's the issue that we're 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 struggling with is um, the sequencing here. We would need to apply in the late spring, early summer, usually June, and the funds need to be available. You know, when you apply, you need to have town meeting or town, in our case, town council approval of those matching funds. So we would need them in the next fiscal year. They would need to be available in FY25 on July 1st, you know, or after. So that's 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 the challenge. Um, I'll make one other comment uh, from my perspective that certainly is an important area uh, in terms of use and central activity that you know, so you know i applaud the forethought many years ago with the planning advanced planning for the whole uh, master plan for the recreation area mm -hmm. uh and you know our challenge is funding and available resources but it's uh i'm glad to see the effort being put into uh, uh do what's possible and Amy may have said it earlier, but so we're going, we're engaging um, right now. We are in the process of, we will be selecting a designer for this area and the War Memorial Bathhouse. I believe we've given them a deadline of June 1st or June 30th of 24 to complete that design. So to Tim's earlier question, we will have a good sense of cost estimates in, you know, they'll be moving in that direction swiftly, March, April, May of 24. So that's kind of the earliest we will be able to get kind of a sense because what go, where does the bathhouse go? How big is it? What are the, what are the, what are, you know, what are requirements from code and, and whatnot? And then what are the amenities around it? Is it simply a basketball court? Is it, I don't know, is it two pickleball courts? Is it uh, a spray pad? What is it, a playground? What, what are the things the community wants around the pool? Those are all yet to be determined. Uh, thank you. Uh, any more, Tim? My apologies previously, somehow my, I, <laughs> I lost my feed. Uh, that raised another question, Dave, and that is, uh, should we feel we can only expend five hundred thousand rather than seven fifty? Is that a game ender for the entire project, or does that mean we can do the project less extensively? Uh, you know that the intent of that question. You know, we can't do A, B, C, D, and E, but maybe we can do A, B, and C if we expend less than the 750. Or does the whole project go away? I guess I, you know, I would say ne never say never. And, you know, if if it's 500, and then, then we kind of run with 500 and see how far we can get. And and run this project out and and go through the design and see where we are, and if for some reason we're not able to make this round of park and land uh, and water conservation fund uh, uh, grant funding, then 
than we hold and you know just have to anticipate that costs will likely increase a year from that point or whenever we get ready to bid the project so um i think if it's a hundred thousand dollars i think we're not going to be able to bridge that gap with any other private or or grant funding because you've got to show that local match to the state and federal government so okay thanks Oh, uh, Bob, you had your hand up. Do, do you have a... Um, Tim asked my question. Thanks. Um, any other questions or comments from committee members? Any other... Uh, yes, Amy. Yeah, no, I... This is just getting back to... Matt maybe didn't ask a question, but made a statement a little earlier about the condition of the bathhouse. And I thought I would just read a paragraph from the request for proposals that we put out to um, contractors that I think kind of summarizes the state of the bathhouse. So we say the War Memorial Pool Bathhouse was built in 1953 and has greatly outlived its useful life. The largest problem is the structural integrity of the building. The roof needs replacement and the masonry walls are starting to fail. These structural issues have led to various problems within the building, including ventilation, plumbing, and paint which all need to be constantly spot repaired to keep the building operational. And so that's really the big push of this whole. And I get that, you know, we keep kind of talking bigger picture, but the big push is this bathhouse um, on an annual basis. My guys do everything they can with, you know, duct tape and glue to try and kind of get this thing um, open for another season. Um, but we're really kind of, um, reaching the end of even what we can do with the resources that we have. Um, and that's the real linchpin of this whole project. Uh, thank you, Amy. Anything else to add, uh, Amy, Ray, or Dave? So thank you, uh, all, uh, all of you for, for persisting with the delays, Amy, with your four presentations. Uh, we do have another presentation on our list and thank the committee members. We're gonna run a little bit over here. Uh, we're going to continue and uh, get this presentation in. Um, it's important that we uh, stick to the date of the schedule. So I see that Aaron is in the uh, list of presenters. So Aaron, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be glad to hear uh, what you have to say. Can you guys hear me? We can. Oh, okay. Yep. I can't see myself on the yep. screen. So Welcome. thank you. Um, did you want me to share? I have a presentation. Do you want me to share my screen? I don't know if I'm able to do that. Um, Holly, are you able to enable that? Um, it's just uh, what I'm going to need to do yes it's just going to take me a second um uh, excuse me as we're pulling that up aaron can you identify who are you i mean what are you work for the town or yes my name's aaron jock i'm the wetlands administrator for the town of amherst okay thank you and this is the trail and restoration trail right. restoration and enhancement right. uh, proposal Correct. Hey, Aaron, so I've just promoted you to a panelist so I can allow you. So I think you're going to have to hit a button there and then I should be able to allow you to share screen. So I just made you a co-host. You should be all set now to share your screen. Great. Thank oh, you. Oh, and there you are. There I am. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, again, Aaron Jock, uh, Wetlands Administrator, and um, here to present on um, some improvements to uh, town conservation lands, um, primarily trails, um, improvements to accessible trails, safety improvements. Um, so we have um, over 80 miles of, of trails on our conservation lands and um, it's really important that we steward those lands and um, take care of the ecosystems uh, that are on those lands in association with the trail management, make the trails safe, um, care for the beaches, um, and make the trails accessible to folks who need to use them, correct historic problems, undersized culverts, uh, and add structures where appropriate, like bog bridging, boardwalks, footbridges, et cetera. Um, focusing on a couple specific um, properties here, uh, Puffer's Pond um, 
Hickory Ridge, uh, the Robert Frost Trail in general, which goes through the town of Amherst, Larch Hill, Markert's Pond, and Amethyst Brook. Um, there's a lot of things that need to happen uh, with these projects, and I tried to give just a general sense of um, planning. So right now there's quite a bit of planning going on for Hickory Ridge, or I'm sorry, for, for Puffer's Pond. Um, and the hope is that in the next couple of years, we're going to be moving toward similar to the presentation you just saw towards grant applications. So then we can move towards construction. Um, Hickory Ridge, uh, we have designed everything. Um, we're in the permitting phase right now and construction is expected in spring of 2024, but only a portion of what we've planned for is funded um, with the current funding that we have. Um, we are in the process. We, we've done quite a bit on the Robert Frost Trail um, over the past few years as far as improvements, but it's a long trail and there's lots that needs to be done. Um, Larch Hill, there's a handicap accessible Not boardwalk. Bad. Sorry, did somebody say something? Oh, okay. Sorry, I heard a little feedback. Um, on Larch Hill, there's a handicap accessible trail with a large boardwalk that needs to be replaced, which requires survey, wetland delineation, design, materials. Um, Markert's Pond, the trails down there are pretty significantly degraded. And Amethyst Brook, um, a few years ago, we lost a um, trail bridge there, which is also on the Robert Frost Trail, but it's a pretty significant trail bridge. And these projects require a significant a significant amount of planning and a significant amount of staff time. Um, in the last year, we did um, lose our conservation land management assistant, who we just rehired someone, and our our land manager was out on leave, so that limited um, our implementation. But we have tried to utilize this time um, in 2023 for planning, and so a significant amount of time, staff time, has been put in planning to try to queue up projects for construction um, next year. And um, things that we frequently need funding for are surveys, wetland delineation, materials, sort of the brick and mortar pieces that go into the construction of these projects. And town staff typically does the permitting um, and if we can, the construction and labor. Um, so I shared some of these images with you last year um, of Puffer's Pond. Puffer's is in really tough shape right now. We have spent the last year visioning for Puffer's Pond, trying to come up with uh, improving some of the ecological impacts that are happening there with erosion, um, loss of vegetation. We also have problems with um, uh, accessibility. Uh, the trails are in really bad shape. Um, and it's really impacted people's recreational use of the property. And and so this visioning process is coming up with, well, what's the, what is the vision of what we want these improvements to look like? And then we can go into grant and design um, getting grants, design, permitting, and construction. So this is kind of the visioning is the first step. Um, for Hickory Ridge, um, <clears throat> we in 2020, uh, we acquired the property in 2022. Um, there's been a significant amount of staff time invested in design of a handicap accessible trail system and a multi-use path for the property. The purpose of the path is to connect the environmental justice communities that are to the north, the Brook, Renew, Mill Valley Estates, to connect it with Crocker Farm School walk walkable access and also the um, South Amherst Village Center. Um, the town has received a 2023 park grant um, toward the accessible trail loop, 2022 mini entitlement grant for the um, multi-use path. And we just found out that we received um, in partnership with the Mass Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, um, uh, this um, NIFWIF grant, America the Beautiful, for quite a bit of um, ecological restoration on the site. Um, we did have some renderings put together for the handicap accessible trails. And so this is um, some images of what those um, trails would look like. Um, and so on this slide, you can see on the left, this is sort of the, the full trail system. Um, 
And on the right, this is what the grants cover. So in order for us to really complete this project, um, there's going to need to be some local funding that goes into this, um, or we're going to have to find additional funding sources. Um, these are some images of the Robert Frost Trail, just to give you a sense of the condition of the Robert Frost Trail, places where there's bridge crossings missing that we need bridge crossings. Um, there's been significant blowdowns with the weather in the last couple years. Um, there's uh, uh, um, accessibility issues. There's um, problems with bridge crossings, bridges that are basically caving in. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I have a, a, a two-year-old who's screaming for me upstairs right now, so I apologize. He's if, if you hear him um, in the middle of my presentation, so I apologize. Um, uh, the uh, Sweet Alice project was um, a bridge project that we constructed in 2022, but the bridge, um, there was a, a beaver that came in, beavers that came in and flooded out the property um, and uh, flooded out the bridge. And so we had to come up with a solution. Um, my, uh, our, our colleagues at Kestrel Land Trust partnered with us to construct this um this bog bridge to reconnect the pond loop trail. And so this is just an example of the sort of um, public private partnership that we can, you know, use to leverage the funds that we get to make some of these improvements on town lands. Um, a few examples of projects on the horizon. These are just some photos of the existing boardwalk at Larch Hill, um, photos of the second boardwalk at Sweet Alice that's needed through wetland. Um, you know, these are examples of, of, again, infrastructure that's, that needs, needs updating. And then the Amethyst Brook Bridge that washed out, this is a 50 foot span over the Amethyst Brook and, um, it's in desperate need of, um, of getting replaced. It's, it's causing a significant amount of, um, damage to the stream bank, uh, where the trail has been rerouted because this bridge washed out, so... Um, that is my presentation. Um, happy Thank to you, Erin. Uh, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share your presentation uh, with Holly uh, and therefore with the committee. Um, yes, absolutely. And perhaps, uh, Amy, I see you're still in the audience, so you might be willing to also share your slides, they all look great and they're quite informative. I think it'd be helpful for me and perhaps others to be able to look at some of the highlights. Um, so thank you. I'd like to open up the, uh, the conversation to any com to committee members who might have any questions or comments. Uh, Tim. Um, Basic question, uh, what exactly is the money for? Uh, do you have it for each specific project or are you requesting a lump sum and then you'll make some decisions later on and do what you can with that lump sum? And if the lump sum is less than 100, you'll do what you can with that lesser money. Uh, that's the kind of question I have. Yeah, so... Um... I think that that what you said is right. You know, we we try to do the best we can with the funds that are available to us. And so, um, you know, as you all know, the cost of materials has fluctuated pretty significantly over the last few years. Um, you know, what we might estimate one year um, to do a given project might cover half of that project two years later. So um, we really sort of try to roll with it and do what we can with the resources we have. We also actively apply for grants whenever we have the opportunity to do so. So if we identify a project, we know we have um, X number of dollars that we could use as a match. Um, we will leverage those funds and or if we identify a project in some cases we get private donations from people we get we have kestrel involved so we can you know piecemeal together some things to complete given projects but um you know it, it, we leverage the funds in the most effective way we can to get as much done on the trails as we can michelle just curious of the 
many projects that you mentioned what what are like your top three priority or maybe top two priority um well i mean i would say puffer's pond and hickory ridge from my perspective are our two top priorities um i will defer to dave you know he's he's got i'm sure his priorities in mind as well uh Nice segue, because Dave, your hand is up. <laughs> sure. So great question from Michelle. I, I would not disagree with Aaron at all. I think uh, Hickory and Puffer's Bond are very high on the list. But, you know, I, I, I wanted to just comment more broadly and, and get back to that. But um, Aaron's presentation covered a lot of ground. And, you know, I, I kind of want to emphasize that, you know, whether it's on the recreation side or the um, or the conservation side, you know, we're we're planners, uh, you know, not unlike the university, not unlike the colleges, we're planning for five, you know, this year, three years down the road, five years down the road, 20 years down the road. You know, we're planners. We want to make things better for the community. So as I listened to Aaron, there was a part of me that was wondering, is everybody on this call getting overwhelmed going, wow, there is a lot to do. So when I listened to Aaron, and it was a wonderful presentation, and I had previewed it earlier today, it, it kind of gets overwhelming. You go, where do we start on these trails? So I wanted to kind of put a pin in that to say, we have great trails. We have 80 miles of trails. People compliment me all the time. It is wonderful. You can hike. You can mountain bike. You can do yoga. You can run. You can do trail running. Um, you can fish. You can hunt. You can do all these wonderful things. Um, and many people don't even notice what we notice as planners. We want to make the trails better. We want to make Puffer's Pond better. I can't tell you how many people come to me and say, don't touch Puffer's Pond. It's good just the way it is. But we look at it through a different lens, not unlike recreation, where we say, wouldn't it be nice if more of Puffer's Pond was accessible to people with disabilities? That would be a wonderful thing. Wouldn't it be nice if we could better protect natural resources and instead of having people slog through six inches of mud and a true wetland resource area, wouldn't it be great if we could put a boardwalk there and raise them up so they don't get their feet wet, their kids can, can have fun on a raised boardwalk, and we protect the natural resources. So I just wanted to get that out there that we get it, you know, we're not looking for a million dollars. I will say that I would put these in categories of kind of short term and long term. So Aaron identified two long-term projects, Hickory Ridge and Puffer's Pond, and we're going to chip away at those over time. This $100,000, and we're starting to come, we've been pretty consistent over the last couple of years coming to the CPAC for a annual, an annual amount of money. Last year, I believe it was reduced to $50,000. Um, so we understand the budgetary constraints uh, the town is going to be under with CPAC money. But again, I think this is really the short-term project money. This is not going to fix Buffer's Pond. This is not going to, you know, uh, it will make an impact at, at Hickory Ridge. As we have, as Aaron indicated, we have CDBG money and um, park grant money for Hickory. But fifty dollars to $100,000 isn't going to get you a dredged Buffer's Pond with new beaches and new trails. That's a long-term goal we have. This is to fix some of the... ADA trails that Aaron showed images of and do some of the routine uh, repairs, upgrades to bridges, boardwalks, things like that. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, David and Aaron. Um, I, I want to inform the committee, we did receive an email this afternoon that I just opened uh, from Aaron. We had asked the question of what was the current balance of funding and the response is that the CPA funds current balances are 24,000 for parcels purchased with CPA funds and 50,000 for passive recreation trails. Uh, this will be uh, sent to the committee members as well, but I just wanted you to be aware that uh, Aaron had responded uh, to the question uh, that we asked once she got that information. Um, I do have a question for you, Aaron. Uh, I recall last year, and I, I gather, uh, as Dave indicated, the scope and breadth of the amount of work and areas of responsibility and uh, 
tasks that are required. I remember last year that we, you know, their rental of equipment rental was a aspect of some of the usage of funds. And I saw it referenced again. And I'm wondering if the town has considered purchasing, I asked this last year, I'll ask it again, a mini excavator or a mini roller. Uh, because if we're renting them year after year, it may well be that it's more cost effective to actually acquire them. If Or if they have not done so, might the town consider searching or even perhaps used ones. Uh, thank you. Uh, I see Dave's hands up. Aaron, uh, are, would you like to answer that question, Dave? Or, or yeah, maybe I could jump in just because Aaron isn't as involved in capital planning as I am. But great question, Sam. When we can, we share equipment with DPW. They've been helpful, for instance, at Markard's Pond, helping us with a, a small dam structure there. But our busy time is DPW's busy time. So their excavators, their minis, their uh, mini excavators, their skid steers and such, um, they can help us and have helped us in the past, but typically um, they're busy when we are. We did through the capital planning process, re so we have tractors, brush hogs, uh, two tractors, uh, three brush hogs, um, we have some other smaller equipment for mowing smaller fields, things like that, keeping early successional habitat. And we were successful after about four years in getting a skid steer um, with mowing equipment on it, uh, as well as a bucket and um, um, associated uh, uh, attachments. So that is something that will help us and will allow us not to have to rent as much equipment, Sam, for instance, to, um, to maintain some of the or enhance some of the uh, ADA trails. Um, I wanted to just address the uh, the funding, the existing funding. I would anticipate the existing funding that we have, given all the planning that Aaron mentioned, we will probably spend through that money by, I would say, uh, late August or early September of 24. So that money that we are have been uh, sitting on, if you will, so the planning could be done, will be gone, you know, in the first six, seven months of 24. Uh, thank you. Um, do any committee members have additional questions or comments uh, for Aaron? Not seeing any hands. Uh, Aaron, is there anything you'd like to add uh, after hearing the questions or comments? I mean, the, the only thing that I would just like to add is, um, you know, we are a really small department and if you think about the amount of lands that our department manages and cares for, we have two staff people who do all of that work and basically two to three staff people, you know, who who sort of do the the sort of more office task type work. And we rely on, you know, funding sources for us to be able to properly steward these lands and do the work to keep these trails safe, make them accessible for the community. And it's really important that we make them accessible for the community for to be safe for folks who have disabilities or, um, you know, access mobility challenges. So um, we want to keep just a couple of the properties, um, a handful of the, the properties, um, accessible for these folks and safe for these folks to use. And so that's that's what this focus is towards. Uh, thank, thank you, Aaron, for uh, your presentation and uh, thorough answers. And uh, I'm, it's clear you're quite busy uh, with, and I know it's late in the evening for you. So thank you for taking the time and waiting uh, beyond our intended schedule uh, due to the volume of public comments received. If we have additional questions as a committee, we might email you, but thank you again. Thank um, you. So the next item on our agenda is financial updates. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen that I have from the packet or Holly, are you able to do it? I, um, I no, it. I mean, if you wanted to share it, you can go ahead and share it, but I just, there is nothing new to report. The numbers are exactly okay. the same as they were um, a week ago today. We've not received any money from 
the state yet. So as yeah. of this point, it's ex exactly as it was last week. I guess I won't share my screen. No need to. So if anybody has questions, that's fine. But if not, I, I don't I don't think it's. I have uh, a question related to finance in general. Um, there are questions related to potential bonding that we've heard today. Um, do we know or might you be able to find out for our subsequent meeting what the anticipated uh, rate of interest would be for a bond were we to do so? And this relates to uh, also relates to the all the different projects. In other words, you did it in your financial pre uh, projection for the current year. I'm wondering if the next year, depend at some point when we start to deliberate, we'll likely arrive at a place where we need to consider the implications for the next two or so years of whether or not we seek to engage in any borrowing. Uh, so if that information could be on the radar, because uh, I'm sure that question will arise, so I'm bringing it up now. Uh, I know we can't predict everything at the time of borrowing, but uh, any general idea I think would be helpful when we come to the point of deliberations. Uh, the other question or comment I have, at some point, it would also be beneficial. I don't know if in the middle of our busy cycle right now is the time, but to receive, uh, the, to ping, to to reach out to the currently outstanding applicants where funds exist for a, a, just a synopsis update of where they're at. We added that to our general process a couple of years ago. I think it's a very worthwhile uh, step, both in terms of finding out if there are proposers that are no longer um, going forward or if they, so if you could just add those two items to your extensive list of, of requests. Um, any questions or comments from committee members? I don't have any additional uh, topics. Uh, um, I'm wondering if anyone has anything else they'd like to bring up. Uh, the last thing I'll say is, uh, as we're hearing all these proposals, we do have some new members. Um, it might be worthwhile to take a look at prior year recordings of prior year deliberations. I know I had sent the links when you first came on board just to get an idea of what's coming down the road. Essentially, what we will do as a committee as a starting point is all of our members here will look at all these projects and simply try to come up with a simple straw poll rating of one to five in terms of how we feel about the project. And that just gives us a ballpark to start to talk about them. But soon enough, in two more meetings, we're going to have the, uh, the next meeting is on the 30th of November, where we'll be hearing historic preservation proposals. And then on December 7th, I believe, uh, 6th or 7th, we will um, comment, we'll have a public hearing. And in that meeting, once we hear from the public, then we begin discussing the projects. And at that point in time, all of us will have wanted to think in our own way on a consistent basis so that we're each internally consistent of um, how we might rate those. So I wanted to rate the projects on a one to five scale. I just wanted to prompt committee members, feel free to uh, email me or reach out to me with any questions on that. Uh, I'd be glad to provide what I can, but I think the best um, method might be to just take a look at uh, a previous meeting where we discussed it, or there's one little chart that kind of summarizes how we went through it. Um, so that's that's all I have. I'd like to thank uh, everyone for staying. We ran extra today, but I think it was worthwhile to hear uh, extensive public comments on the uh, presentations or on the areas of uh, uh, application this time around. So thank you all. I'm going to adjourn the meeting at 8.25 p.m. and we'll see you all at our next meeting, which is not next week, but the following week, two weeks from now. Thank you all. Good night.
Yok.